Welcome everyone to our 2021 symposium. Let's adapt our services to that diversity of survivors. Um, the symposium is organized by the West Island Collax, so I'm the project manager. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, the West Island Collax is a sexual assault center for women. Um, today, it's the third webinar. So we started, I think this uh, Tuesday. And uh, this month we have six webinars to present and we are at the third one today, this morning. Thank you for being here. I am very excited. So the title of this webinar today is Indigenous Intervention Practices, Embracing Dignity, Safety and Culture in Violence, Recovery and Prevention. So today we have amazing moderator, an amazing moderator and panelist, uh, presenter, uh, Catherine Richardson and Vicky Baldo. So this symposium takes place on unce unceded indigenous lands, the island called Montreal, known as Jojage, and the language of the Ganegehaga nation is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Um, as an organization that centers uh, social justice and intersectional feminism, we feel that it is very crucial to be informed about the past and ongoing consequences of colonialism. I encourage everyone to learn, to educate themselves, and to learn about the history of this land and support indigenous res resistance. <laughs> um, so it is for me it is important to start uh, each webinars with the land acknowledgement just to remind ourselves that uh, this land doesn't belong to us it was stolen and it is important as i think that a lot of people work in intervention or accompany people through difficult times or support folks and their own work i think that's why most of the people are here and i think it's important while we do that amazing work we also have to think about what uh, support indigenous communities communities need as well. So I think it's important to start with the land acknowledgement at first. I try to share something uh, uh, something different at the beginning of each webinar. So um, I wanted to talk a bit about the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. So since 2014, uh, the data that we have was it was an estimate of 1,186 missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in the span of 30 years. And now you were all aware about the report that was published uh, in 2019. Um, and the report says that there are no reliable estimates on the numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and the uh, to SLGBTQIA persons in Canada. So I think that it is really important to reflect on that, that uh, of this genocide and think about like, there's no estimate. So it really enforces the important that we, there's something that we, we have to do something. And I think that we've been waiting, we've pushed this to the side, that issue to the side. And I think that it's important to think about that. So Vicky is a Metis Cree 60s scoop survivor residing in Quebec. Vicky is a registered uh, energy medicine practitioner and plays a central role in urban Aboriginal community of Montreal. She was co-chair of Montreal Indigenous Community Network from 2015 to September 2019 um, and has held numerous board positions and various uh, capacities, including uh, the board of directors of the Native Indigenous Survivor Welfare uh, Network, the Native Women's Shelter of Montreal, the First People's Nature, Nature um, the First People Justice Center of Montreal. She is currently in-house cultural uh, support worker in Concordia's Aboriginal Student Resource Center and a member uh, of Indigenous Directions Leadership Council uh, for the university. Vicky uh, also provides support and is an advisory member in various research projects that touch on issues of welfare, uh, female incarceration, uh, urban Indigenous youth, and land-based education. 
she try she strives to be a leader of integrity to communicate well and to create safe spaces for uh, the self empowered of empowerment of others. Most importantly, Vicky is a daughter, a sister, an auntie, mother of four, and grandmother to ten. Connection to ceremony and culture plays a big part in the 20, 28 plus years healing journey that Vicky has been on. It gives uh, her passion, it gives her the passion and focus to give back to the community and use her voice to advocate for those uh, that are uh, muted by colonial oppression. So thank you so much. I'm very honored to have you here today. Thank you so much, uh, Vicky. Uh, for being here as our moderator today. So I will leave the floor to you both. Yes, come on. Uh, so thank you so much for having us, Tara, and for this amazing team that you have uh, that's put this conference together. Catherine and I are both very appreciative of that. Uh, so welcome everybody and um, I'm, I'm not going to take up too much time. I know we have a lot of material that we want to be able to share with you. So uh, I get the immense honor to introduce to you uh, Dr. Catherine Richardson, mm -hmm. who is for me uh, very much a kin, very close kin, uh, spirit sister. And, um, but she's been so much more than that in my life, a teacher, a mentor, um, a really, really good friend. And um, so Catherine and I get to work together uh, at Concordia, but she's also a therapist, a researcher, an activist. She's an author. Uh, there are a couple of new books that have just come out in the past year. And I think another one that's uh, hopefully heading out for publishing. Um, so she's the director of the First People's Studies Program at Concordia. Uh, she's co-founder of the Center for Response-Based Practice. Uh, Kathy is, she's Métis, Cree, Dene, and Gwich'in ancestry. She teaches counselors and social workers, uh, promotes system change and decolonization in all areas of social service. You know, I'm reading this and I think of all of the the traveling we've done together and how we've collaborated. And um, she leads research for a number of current studies such as the Quebec Youth uh, Network Chair, the Canadian De Domestic Homicide Prevent, Prevent Initiative with Vulnerable Populations and Documenting Promising Practices for Indigenous Transition House Work. Kathy's the winner of a Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association Indigenous Practice Award in 2019. She is co-organizer of the Dignity Conferences and um, as I said, currently working on uh, another book to be coming out. And Kathy also ran, I remember this, she ran with such passion for the Green Party in the 2018 election. So I welcome you and introduce you to Dr. Richardson. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vicki. Wow, I've got to edit that uh, intro so it's way shorter. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to be here with all of you and with my dear sister, Vicki Boldo as well. So, Tanse uh, Nitotentek, Noeuin Kinu Iskweu, that's my Cree name. It means golden eagle woman. Um, I'm Metis and I have ancestry long ago from the Quebec Cree community, uh, from Red River, and my mother's from the community of Fort Chipoyan in northern Alberta, as is her mother and her mother. So, um, that's a community for Métis, Cree, and Chipewyan people. So I'm happy to be here in Jojage and um, doing this important work. Um, one of the things uh, I'd like to invite you to also invite your ancestors to come and be with you. Vicki and I did a smudge before we started today and 
we'll close with a song for you after. Um, it's really important that we do this work respectfully and safely and carefully. Um, I wanna thank you for caring and thank you for the good work that you do to help keep indigenous women and girls and people and communities safe. I saw some of the list of people who were coming in and I know many of you have been doing this work for a long, long time. So one of the teachings that I received that I really enjoy is that uh, our ancestors set this day up a long time ago. They knew that just all of us would be together. I don't know if they knew that it would happen on Zoom um, because like who, who could know that, right? <laughs> who could envision this kind of technology and that we'd all be inside a house like for, for, for almost a year now. Um, but uh, it's a lovely thought that this was all part of someone's greater plan to help keep people safe and respected and cared for and belonged on this planet. So um, Vicki, I'll just, uh, I'll say hi, hi, when it's time to change the slides, if that's okay. Yeah, and we're that just, sounds uh, great. So hi, hi, and thank you, Tara, so much for the um, land acknowledgement and for setting up uh, the guidelines and the safety for this uh, presentation today and uh, usually I go by she and her but I'm happy to be called they <laughs> if you want to do that and we'll do, we'll do our best to be respectful to everyone in this room hi hi we're acknowledging the land and uh, you can change it Vicky So Vicky's just going to talk a little bit about why it's important to acknowledge the lands and how we should refer to that. So I guess I, I just start off by acknowledging, even for myself, I am I'm not in Jojage today. Uh, since COVID, I have been working from home, and I live, work, and play out here on these lands on uh, traditional Abenaki territory. Um, out in the eastern townships and um, I try and keep that I, I really try and remind myself and keep that in mind all the time that uh, to walk with much respect and humility and um, I'm so fortunate that I do I get to play on the waters I have the lake right down the road and I spend a lot of time on on that water or near it and um, the same thing with with being in my yard, my heart goes out to everybody um, with, with all of this uh, lockdown that's happening and, and being under curfew. Um, I get to, you know, be, be out on the land, be out around my home on, the, on this little, little block of, of land that I have that are surrounded by uh, cedars. And so I, I often, when I'm speaking with Others, I say, well, you know, why does this matter? Why does it matter to know um, where where you are? And no matter where I travel, I always try and um, inform myself beforehand of, of where I'm going to and who are the uh, traditional peoples of those lands and what are the stories. The stories are important to understand. And I think, especially in these times, you know, since 2015, where uh, we're talking all the time about reconciliation and it's important that we all know the same stories and that we all own those together. Um, and as I say, the more we, we know ourselves, the better we understand ourselves and vice versa. The better we understand ourselves, the better we know ourselves. So just keeping in mind all the time in those lands, when we look at a map like this of um, you know, we talk about pre-contact that there were, they predict there were over, you know, a hundred million um, vibrant, thriving uh, Indigenous peoples uh, across these, across these lands, across, just across Turtle Island. So um, just to, to keep that in mind of how the land really sustains us. It's the land, the land provides everything we need. And um, 
the language, the language with each of those territories as well is tied to the land. And so even as we look around the world, I read at one point where, you know, every three days there's languages that are going into uh, danger of um, major loss and extinction. And, and I just think that as a human population that uh, we're all losers when, when we lose that knowledge um, because it could be in those lands in those particular lands where the languages of and the knowing the knowledge of um, medicines and and so much history. Mm -hmm. This was one of uh, Kathy's Kathy's slides where in her work that she's done uh, out in the couch and um, you know just the, the the loss and how you know like I'm saying that we all need to to know the stories. We all need to know the same stories in order to be able to move forward. There's so much healing that happens in that truth telling. Mm -hmm. And land is life. That's uh, our dear colleague, Alan Wade, who uh, works with Kathy um, through the response-based uh, practice. Mm -hmm. This one I, I bring up, I, I just want to point out that uh, Aboriginal First Nations, that for me right away was a bit of a flag where I'm thinking, okay, who created this map? And so there's always something about being having a critical eye when we see things and, and looking into it a little bit so that again, you kind of, um, it's, it's all in getting, educating yourselves and not always going to indigenous peoples to, to get that, that education or that information because that can be very tiring as well. But still an interesting map to, to show uh, the nations and the, and the proper names. Um, but again, I would say just to be critical as this map was created by a non-indigenous person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's me. And I guess one of the ways I didn't locate myself is that I'm a woman with a disability in, 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 return, in regards to mobility and I'm a two-time cancer survivor. And so I integrate that into my work, acknowledging the importance of mother earth and our care for her, for the environment, for our waters the importance of clean water and engaging um, with industry and trying to um, consider mining and pipelines and their role in polluting our lands and waters because there's, I've recently um, been more focused on this triangle between indigenous women's health and well being, violence against indigenous women. And also illness, because at the root of so many conditions that people live with, whether they're called psychological conditions or physical health conditions, violence is at the foundation. And what I would also say is untreated violence, violence for which women didn't have enough safety to even talk about or there weren't the services and supports to go get help. So over the years, we've had to manage this ourselves and many people do it very carefully through abusing med uh, using medicines and substances. And sometimes that means con consumption. Um, we're always trying to manage our pain. And when it gets safe enough and competent enough to really support this important kind of healing, then we'll find other ways as well. Um, but right now we're doing the best that we can. Hi, hi. Oh, so I think Tara did mention a lot of, about myself as well, but one of the things I could say is, yes, I'm an uh, adoptee from the 60s and my, my mother and my Kokum were from Treaty 6 territory. Uh, my 
grandmother um, was born in, in Pajonan and, um, and then spent quite a few years in Canistano before moving on to Melfort and then out to the West Coast. And my grandmother, um, my cookum was, a, she was a language speaker. And so that's one of the, one of the sadnesses that I, I carry is um, uh, that, that disconnect from the language. Um, because when they did move um, with my, my grandfather who was English and when, so when they moved out to the West Coast, um, it was dangerous times. And uh, my grandfather had said, you know, enough of that, no more, no more speaking that, that crazy talk. And, and yet when I, I I've connect, reconnected with my biological family, obviously, and, and when I listen to the stories uh, that my biological uncle shares, and he always says how the, the happiest times that he remembers uh, in his youth were when Kokum um, would be with, with her siblings, when the aunties and uncles would come over and they'd be sitting around the, the table all speaking in language and there was so much laughter. So um, yeah, that's a little bit of more about me. And, and today is a pretty special day. I've got uh, our daughter right now who is in contractions. And so we're waiting <laughs> for our 11th grandchild. And uh, it's a pretty beautiful thing as an adoptee, that person who was disconnected um, and also came from a lot of extreme neglect and abuse and violence um, all through my uh, my childhood and, and youth until I came out here to Quebec from, from BC, from Vancouver Island. And, and it's been 35 years now. This, yeah, moving into year 35, being out here and being raised up a lot from the, uh, from the Ghani and Gahaga and uh, also then reconnecting to Cree elders from uh, the, the same territory as my, my Kokum. But to see my children and my grandchildren now growing up with their heads up, with their heads up high and, and with pride. And, the, and, you know, my mother always reminds all of us that the, the very good, healthy, strong roots that we come from in our Cree Métis um, lineage Mm -hmm. thanks so here Vicky. we go yeah thank you Vicky and I just want to take a moment also to think of about my grandmother and my mother because um today my mother's having an operation so I, I I think of her and her safety and and how so many of the women in our families are at these important different life stages and I want to just acknowledge my my grandma, Evelyn Oak, because even though she was from Fort Chippewa a very small town, they lived in the bush, they were trappers. She always believed in girls and she believed in education. And so when her husband said, girls shouldn't get an education, they should just learn to be housewives and support their husbands. My grandmother secretly, um, helped my mother to enroll in the University of British Columbia and to do a degree in pharmacy and send her money to pay for her tuition and her rent because my grandpa wouldn't, wouldn't help. And so my mother graduated with a degree in pharmacy. And right after that, she got married and she had two children and she put all that aside. And then later on in life, she took up uh, indigenous medicine and natural medicine. Um, and she lived on Vancouver Island at the same period that Vicky's talking about. And there was no cultural safety. If you were um, an indigenous person who was proud of that or presented, presented that part of yourself in the world, you were exposed to serious racism. It was really harsh. So all the things that our ancestors went through and the women in our families, um, they make it so we're here today and it's just important to think of that all of us to think of those um, women in our families so not not everything about this presentation is distressing um, but there are moments of it and we live in an era that we call trauma-informed 
I prefer to call it safety informed. Like we want to take care of people's emotional health while the while they're learning your emotional well being. We shouldn't have to be, you know, terrorized or traumatized in a classroom um, just to learn the things we need to learn. You already probably watch television. You probably already have taken courses or workshops on violence against women. We don't talk about that with you know, gratuitously, um, we only bring up these issues as they're important. And um, we also embed our stories into stories of resistance and survival and beauty and joy and the spirit of, you know, trying, of being alive and doing the best you can. So I know that you already know how to take care of yourself and you do whatever, especially you're at home. Um, you can do whatever you want. You can just walk away. You can leave. You can go have a glass of water. You can go out on your porch for a cigarette, whatever you need to do to take care of your well-being. Um, when we do refer to violence against women, because that's a harsh reality. And we all, we all have to live with it every day. So we acknowledge the gifts and the dignity of all people and that everyone matters. Um, but it is also important to focus on those who are most targeted and to address the people who are doing the most targeting. So that relates to interpersonal violence, but also to structural violence, systemic violence and government. Hi, hi. Yeah, so Tara, made reference to this situation. And this is a situation that has been happening probably uh, since contact and probably ongoing since Confederation and when Turtle Island became here in the North known as Canada. Um, this figure is a bit different than what Tara cited. Uh, 5,712 Indigenous women uh, reported gone or missing in 2016. Now we've lost count. So the number is so high, uh, but also as was pointed out by uh, the Native women of Quebec, when we talk about missing, we refer to lots of things such as being taken away and put, in, put into foster care or leaving the community uh, due to violence and setting up home somewhere else and distancing yourself from your community because it didn't feel safe at that time. Um, we've recently, last year, received the final report of the National Inquiry, and it has some interesting things to say. And even though the uh, Canadian politicians that created the space for this research to be done, um, validated the, the need for the program after so much um, public demands. They also rebuke the findings and saying that this isn't a genocide against women. This isn't about femicide. You know, this is just about a few unfortunate situations. So we have to keep challenging that because anytime you harm women with productive reproductive powers so that you are interfering with their ability to have more children, to have, bring more indigenous children into the world, you are committing a genocide. So we have to go out and support this, this document and the real the difficulties that they had in bringing all this to the fore. It wasn't an easy process at all, and it wasn't perfect, um, but certainly it's a start and I hope the momentum keeps, keeps growing. This isn't over, this is just beginning. Hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. So my community here in Jojage with Vicky and some of my other Indigenous women colleagues, as well as the work I do with the Center for Response-Based Practice and on a number of research projects, um, we're trying to address the issue of ongoing violence against women and girls in many forms. And if people say, uh, well, how come you're not 
focusing on like indigenous boys and indigenous men or men in general, uh, we say, of course, we care about them. We care about everyone. And we all can't do everything. And so because of our personal experiences, we've chosen to focus on this topic of the violence against Indigenous women and pray that other people and men will focus on uh, how to stop violence against men. Because actually men are the number one victims of men's violence. And then, and then, then our women. Um, so there's lots of other people and lots of other genders that need to take on part of that issue. And we're here today to focus on this topic, right? We're, we're here to talk about, um, maybe decolonization is too big a word, um, but how can we dismantle the colonial house that has caused so much harm and continues to perpetuate so much harm and rebuild a structure that means that the, the most vulnerable people are cared for. So this is one way we try to think about events in terms of a response-based analysis. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. So if you're assessing a report, say it's a psych psychologist report about a, a woman, because you know when, uh, when mothers experience violence by their male partners if there's children involved you might have a custody battle you might have child welfare involved um, and often women are sent to get a psychological report meaning that because they're a victim of violence there's something wrong with them now and so we can test that right from the start just because bad things happen to you doesn't mean something's wrong with you just because you have problems doesn't mean something's wrong with you Actually, um, being a victim of violence, it doesn't mean you're a bad parent. So we have to, you know, put that wedge in the door right away. Um, and so you can use this to analyze reports, to look, analyze the media representations of violence against women, to understand how there's so many factors around just what the man is doing to the woman. Um, or in same-sex couples, you know, what the perpetrator is doing to the so-called victim. Um, so many things around that you have to understand. So I'll give you an example. The social material conditions relates to who's in power in your community and basically how ethical or how corrupt are they? Whenever there's uh, ethical and good leadership, women and children are safer. It's just the way it is. Whenever the leadership is corrupt, uh, women and children are less safe. And that goes in the mainstream Euro communities and it goes in for indigenous communities too. So I ask you this question, where you live, who is most likely to get charged or blamed for a crime they did not commit? And who's most likely to get away with a crime they did commit. So typically that's people in power. They tend to get away with things more than um, a person of color on the street, for example. We have racial po profiling. So I ask you that question. What's that like where you live? You know, who gets away with stuff? Who can hurt people with impunity? And the center situation interaction, that's looking at what typically happens like on a daily basis, underneath that ceiling, underneath that roof, in that house, in that home, in that workplace, in that institution, in that school. So imagine me, I've done a lot of work with the Casca people in the Yukon around, you know, Watson Lake and Ross River. And so imagine me one day, I'm driving down the road in my rented car <laughs> and I see a woman walking down the street and she's got two different shoes on her feet and she's an indigenous woman. And so other cars are going by too when they've looked at her and wondered, they've thought about this and had their own judgments, right? So I go by and because I'm a trained professional, 
I tried to make an assessment. Why would a, somebody be wearing two different shoes? So I think, okay, well, is she colorblind? Uh, was she in a hurry this morning? Does she have really bad fashion sense or could she not find a pair? And so I might even pathologize her and say, oh, well, she's obviously got this uh, neurological deficiency called color blindness or something like that. Um, but then I find out that she lives with a violent man and every morning before he goes to work, he takes one of each of her pairs of shoes and puts it in the trunk of his car because he doesn't want her to go out. So uh, that's the offender action. So what does she do? How does she respond? How does she resist? So what she does is she says, I'm going out anyway. And she puts on whatever shoes she can find. Hopefully there's like a right foot and a left foot. And she goes out on the street and she walks into town and she's going to go to a meeting. I don't, I don't know exactly what, but say, imagine that she's going to go to the social service, the CLSC, the Yukon version of that. And she's going to say, um, hello, I need some, uh, I'm here to get some money because I want to leave my husband who's, who's um, sometimes violent and I want to move out with my kids. I want to get an apartment and start a, a life of safety. And I can do that if you could please give me $3,000. And so the social service worker, because we know what they're like, says, of course, ma'am, right away, let me just go in the back and I'll cut you a check. And so, you know, like five minutes later, the worker's back and hands her a check and says, here you are, ma'am, have a nice life, like good for you. So, so we know that happens all the time, right? So most of the time we know that doesn't happen, right? <clears throat> Often um, women are told they were wrong. They chose a bad man. How could they be so silly? Uh, they're an alienating parent if they talk to their child about safety when they go visit dad because they, the judge said they have to go visit dad. So all these things, we, we blame her. We send her for a psychological assessment. Uh, we say that maybe she had attachment disorders with her own mother. Whatever we do, we pathologize her and we blame her. We make her partly responsible. And sometimes when child's welfare is involved, they might make a case that she's too traumatized to parent now. I heard one uh, case where a social worker removed four children because um, she didn't want the children to see her mom, their mom crying, right? So, you know, typically she's not handed a $3,000 check and, and wished well. So she has to then respond to all these social responses. So she has to manage, you know, the police officer, if she's making a report, the school principal, the CLSC worker, um, everyone who would judge her, maybe her ex-husband or her husband and all his family and her family. She has to manage all these people. She's trying to repair and preserve her own reputation as well and her dignity, because what so often happens is that perpetrators of violence tend to destroy or try to attack the reputation of their victim first so that when she actually goes to tell people he's already isolated her from friends and family and put out the idea that she's not of sound mind that she's a bad mother a bad housekeeper she's you know she's not a very good wife and she already she's mentally ill in some way so he's kind of tainted her reputation so that people won't believe her or they'll treat her as if it must have been partly her fault too, which we don't believe, right? So, because we study how she resisted. In this case, she did all these things. She found the shoes that worked. She walked out, even though it was 20 below and all these people were driving by her. Some of them were opening their windows and yelling racial slurs at her, or chucking a beer can at her, whatever. And she goes through all this and she goes into a social service office knowing that she's not going to be treated very well, that they're going to kind of roll their eyes at her request for money and make her go to all these programs, but she does it anyway. She does all these things. And then she responds to everyone's responses. So we understand that everything she's doing is trying to preserve her own dignity, her own safety as much as she can and the safety of her children and those around her. So when you use a model like this, 
you can list all the acts of resistance that you see, everything that she do, she did to hold it together and how she's been doing that for so long, like managing this violent man to minimize the negative effect that he has on everybody. And so that's all knowledge. And so we need to be documenting this and feeding that back and saying, I see you doing all these things. Um, you're a really competent person. And then you can interview about you know, kind of using this model, like, uh, like what made you think of that? Like when was the first time you had to do something like that um, to create some safety or, you know, to plan for your escape? And she'll talk to you about her history and other times she's had to do that. And so I'm, that's how we get away from deficit psychology, from victim blaming, from saying there's something wrong with her. Um, you know, there might be something wrong with her, but that's another topic. This is it, the interaction the, around violence and responses to it. So, so typically, like one of the major flaws with Western psychology is they look at just unidirection. They look at the actions of the perpetrator and how they basically hit the woman and then how the woman is affected as if she is an object. So we never talk about, I mean, hardly ever do we talk about how people are affected by things. We look at the interaction. So what was done and how did the person re respond? That's called like social analysis of interaction. Yeah, so I guess just to simplify it a little, or even just for us to, to keep thinking all the time of, um, you know, when Kathy and I talk about colonialism and that that uh the big form of humiliation and so for those of you that are here today that know me like uh, part of Kathy's job is to keep me on track because I start storytelling and and go off on tangents but when I was thinking of this slide in particular of of uh all of the humiliation like how many times I've heard people say that thing of kind of well you know that was in the past uh or that was a long time ago or you know or when are you going to be able to move on um and yet something like the indian act which created and continues to create and and foster that that humiliation that um lack of it 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 deters our, our sense of pride because of, um, you know, the things of blood quantum and how often I've thought of individuals who've said to me, like, blood quantum, you know, who uh, they don't remember ever having received a blood test uh, to actually measure, like, what is that? How, how native are you um, that you can get assigned a number um, and and that you carry that number with you for for the the whole time of your your life your your earth walk um you know we think of of education and and with the students that i work with um that enfranchisement that happened where if you became a, a lawyer or a doctor, if you went and got an education, got a degree, if you were in the Canadian army and you went off to fight in the war, when, when you would come back, you were no longer recognized as a status native. And um, how, the, how those, those uh, policies and legislature and being put in place, how that chips away at, at the pride and the dignity that Kathy speaks of, how that just eats away at that. Um, and so even with students I work with today where they come down from the North or from remote communities to get an education, but their parents and their grandparents lived those processes and, um, and it still affects them so much how each time they, they leave to come down um, for studies and, and their grandparents are just, it's hard for them to get their minds around of like, oh, why are you going to go? Like there's all of that, that, um, that memory, that, that 
cellular memory, that body memory of the of all of the pain that was created because of these things. Vicky, can I just add something there? Yeah. I just want to let everyone know that around 10 years ago, we, we had the common experience payment. And that's when the federal government said, okay, we're going to make some reparations for certain um, First Nations children that attended uh, what they call residential school. We call them prison camps for Indigenous children. Uh, so they set out a payment guideline and then they got lawyers to have meetings with people to determine what happened to them. And it was almost like a game show because you had to say certain words. So if you mentioned, for example, certain kinds of physical abuse, it was like ping and you got a dollar and you had to mention certain forms of sexualized abuse. And it was like, ping, you got $2 and you might get more money being if you talked about penetration so you could get like five dollars if you said that word and if the a person who was trying for their whole life to forget what had been done to them and then now they're here and they're asked to bring it up and remember it in detail um even though in many first people's cultures and communities People are humble and they don't like to talk about personal private parts and their body and things to do with sex. They don't talk about that publicly and they're asked to do something. The payment based on these words that they would say, and I've even seen like the lawyers were even trying to help the person and say, you have to say the word rape, or you have to say the word penetration. Otherwise you're not going to get that thousand dollars. And it's just, it was just shocking. So I just want to point that out as one form of humiliation that I witnessed, you know, that was very dreadful and that people would say after those sessions, they didn't offer anything to my mom or to my parents. We were kidnapped from them. They suffered so much. And one man said, that's why today I've turned this, this hearing, this session into a ceremony to acknowledge my mother because you do not acknowledge her and the pain that you caused her and my whole family. So I just wanted to add that in, Vicki. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then the research that's coming out also of how um, how many in individuals we've lost uh, because of those settlement payments, right? Yeah. Um, and and now being part of the the sixty scoop healing foundation as well, we're we're seeing that with these like menial payments that have been given to sixty scoop survivors, but how. Um, because money has has a different different meaning, right? In in for Indigenous people in many ways, like especially that kind of money. So in our here we're just saying how um, a lot of the uh, a lot of change, I guess, that is happening. Kathy alluded to this earlier of of you know who are the, who are the women that are um, making these or contributing to these changes. And, a, and you know, we were acknowledging our, our mothers and our grandmothers and uh, each of us, no matter, no matter where we come from, um, which lands we come from. If you, if you look at those women in, in, your, in your lineages of, of how many of them were um, change makers and shifted things. I, I think of, um, I was listening to a, a, a lecture last week from uh, Sylvia McAdam from Idle No More speaking about uh, treaty and saying how, how important and didn't, I don't think I actually knew that there were so many, there were the treaty women who were actually informing the men when those treaties were being uh, created and how the men kept going back to, to consult with the women. And they were there, they were there all along. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, the, the, the right to vote, um, education, how Bill C-31, you know, was, those were all changes that were, um, that were done by women. I think of it in, in recent stories, you know, you think of uh, Colton Bushy, the whole Colton Bushy story, for those of you that are not familiar, it, young, um, beautiful young uh, Cree youth who was uh, killed at point blank um, in, in Saskatchewan. And uh, Gerald Stanley, who, who got off on those initial charges, and I think the, the final charges were just because of uh, the, the, the weapons that they found on his property. But he actually shot the young man like right, right in the head at, through the window of his truck. But Colton Bushy's sister, how she, um, she's gone all the way to the United Nations. Mm. Um, to fight for that and then there's a really a really great film that recently uh came out that was created um sharing sharing that story mm -hmm. so yeah again just the importance of um it's something we do as women isn't it we we put our lives on the line mm. So I share this little story because dignity, human dignity and dignity of all life forms and our more than human kin is central to response-based practice. And it's central to human beings as we are spiritual beings. So every culture and every person might have a different sense of like what dignity is how do I show it in my body? How do I treat others with kindness, respect, and dignity according to my own or our shared culture? And this is an excerpt from Nelson Mandela's um, bio autobiography when he talks about how he realized that was so important to him. And basically he was playing with some young boys. He was riding on a donkey and they were young. And one of his friends took a stick and whacked the donkey on the behind and it bucked him off and he went flying through the air and he landed in a prickle bush. And he said, I was bleeding and crying and hurting and my, they were laughing at me. And that was the first time I had felt the sting of humiliation and, and how terrible that was. And then at that moment he vowed that he would never treat another person that way, which is what many people who've been harmed by violence do. They make those commitments. I, when I'm a mom, I'm never gonna um, treat children this way. Or when I'm an adult, I'm never gonna treat children badly or whatever that people say that's important to them. And he made a promise that, you know, later on when he was in politics, he would defeat his opponents you know, through strategy or cunning or intellect, but he would never humiliate them because he thought that was a terrible fate. I just wanna say that in, in our families and cultures, we teach children right from the start that you're not allowed to hurt people's feelings. You can't eat Aunt Meg's spaghetti and spit it out and say, yuck, this is terrible without an adult coming and intervening. We don't say like, pass the F in salt. We say, could you please pass the salt? Because we know that to humiliate another person or to be really uh, rude or embarrass them, it causes a social wound. And that can fester for years. We've seen families feuding because one, per one person insulted them or, um, you know, treated them in a bad way. Like two generations ago, families organized this. So when there's a social wound, we have to address it. And we have to address it with all the people involved. So everyone knows that, oh, it's been made right. And um, that's, that's what relates to uh, people who've been hurt. When somebody attacks you, you feel like you've been acted upon against your will. 
and you feel embarrassed and sometimes you don't always want to tell everybody and you make careful decisions about who to tell and how to disclose. And so often when we say something like the genie is out of the bottle and we lose control of it. So when we're trying to help people, we have to center their will and well-being and ask them, how can I, how can I help you? What would you like me to do right now? When I would facilitate family meetings, I'd ask people um, a number of questions, but one is, oh, what's one thing I should never do with you? And, you know, they tell me and I try to respect it because they know um, their own life and what's going to work, right? They know the people involved and yeah, if we had more time, I would go through, I would go through what this means, but I'll just comment at this point, like most people don't like to get advice. The only time people like to get advice is if they ask you, could you please give me directions to the CLSC or tell me what I should do here or tell me what my options are. They might ask you, can you please tell me what I should do here? Cause I have no idea. Um, but other than that, if people don't ask for it, we should not give them unsolicited advice or we shouldn't even do it like therapists do and they couch it in questions. Like, I wonder what would happen if you went and apologized to your mother-in-law. Like you can see that there's advice snuck in there, right? So what we really need to do is realize that when we give advice, there's kind of a three-part message embedded there and I would ask you if we were in a classroom, what's the message? So one part is, um, I know better than you. And the other part is I have to tell you what to do because you're too stupid to know yourself because if you did know, you would have already done it and you haven't. So you can see it's all about like imposition and oppression. So be really careful about that idea about advice giving. Um, and so asking permission is important. Would it be okay if I shared my opinion with you? And if they say, nah, it's okay, then don't do it, right? <laughs> this is all about the person's dignity. Hi, hi. So when we talk about resistance, it's this isn't just like about hitting back, right? It's about all the subtle forms. It's the way we replay things in our head and say, oh, next time I'm going to do this or say this. I should have. It's just how we think and how we feel and how we pay attention to the information that our body gives us to guide us to know what to do. So basically we, we talk about it as any mental or behavioral act through which we try to expose or, you know, withstand, repel, stop violence or any form of disrespect or the conditions that make that possible. So broad definition and uh, resistance is one response, but there's lots of other responses and not all are resistance, right? But it's the way our spirit and the life force tries to grow. Even though somebody poured a bucket of cement over it, we still try to make our presence known, right? Next. <laughs> so I just wanted to say a word about truth telling, because I know in our cultures, honesty is one of the values. And if you're a Christian, they'll tell you like honesty is important. You should tell the truth and you should respect your elders. And I just want to say like people with power and people who have stability and good lives. Yeah. You can follow your codes of ethics and you can tell the truth all the time if you want. Um, but sometimes it's not a good idea. Right. And I just, I don't want to, um, you know, perpetrators exploit the goodness of victims and the way we try to do the right thing. So I just want to point out that if you were living in Germany under the Third Reich and somebody comes to you and says, are you hiding some Jewish people in your attic? You know what's going to happen if you say yes. So I say it's okay to be careful. Like sometimes telling the truth is a privilege of the safe. I'll just leave that with you. You can do what you want with it. As an Indigenous woman, even as a younger woman, um, but even now as a, as a grandmother, and there's something creepy about that kind of romanticization, the sexualization of, um, 
of indigenous women. Think of, you know, I know somebody, uh, an artist now who's been collecting for quite a few years, a couple of decades, collecting different versions of the, the Pocahontas doll. And, and something she'd like to do now is to start re, uh, re-costuming <laughs> Pocahontas in back mm-hmm. into back into uh, outfits of um, I guess dignity and respect that are more culturally um, situated, just more appropriate. I think. How many times too do I have people who approach me just when they find out you're you're indigenous and and people will approach and say like oh, you know what? Oh, I had this dream. Can I tell you about it? Like as if I'm the, I'm the, the dream interpreter. Have you ever had that, Kathy? <laughs> yeah, you're so spiritual because you're indigenous. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, kind of, that kind of thing. So just bringing some awareness to that. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, we just wanted to point out like, there have been really brave people who've tried to address this and we just basically need more of them. But Margaret Mitchell, she was a member of parliament and on international women's day, she stood up. There were, I think two other women members of parliament and a whole bunch of guys in suits. And when she said one of the biggest issues in Canada is the, is wife beating and people laughed at her and they mocked her and they made fun of like they tormented her and uh it's really disgusting and it's not that long ago so um vicky i'm just wondering if you could move ahead a little bit yeah um we can go ahead about like four slides truth telling no go even more because um let's go let's stop here Okay. So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, one of the problems in cha- in making changes in Canada is so much of our, um, you know, our politicians are connected to or in the pockets of CEOs of big corporations and mining companies, even like Concordia and McGill, we get a lot of money from mining companies and like corporations that are Uh, polluting the environment and who are not always um, really active and making sure that that there's no violence against women because they're a mining community in the middle of an indigenous land or community and so basically the issues have been you know there's a lot of single guys that go up to mining communities and they get a paycheck Mm -hmm. And they go out and they want to date and they can buy cocaine and drinks and hotel rooms. And they, they look for women in the community, obviously where they are. And some of those women are not 18, they're girls and they're being exploited and all sorts of things are happening. And so who's going to take responsibility for this and who like from the top level, how hard can you actually come down on a corporation and sanction them? for the violence that they're uh, committing without them, you know, threatening to pull out of your country and move to Bolivia. And, you know, so the economy is so embedded in these kinds of processes. It's going to take a lot of lobbying and restructuring and a new, a new economy um, to make sure that the safety of people and and uh, women and girls and indigenous communities, the safety and dignity is protected. It's going to take a lot of a lot of work. Um, so, Vicky, can you go ahead uh, two slides to the Highway of Tears? Yeah. So that's yours. We're just going to talk a little bit about the importance of doing this together and grieving together. Yeah, and, and the healing that can happen, right? Um, I guess a bit like I said in the beginning of um, that we all that we all know and share the same stories, the same the the, the same history, and um, that it's in in that collective 
right? That because we all, we all have lost um, through, through those processes. We've all lost through, through colonization. Um, but I think, you know, again, I always speak from a, a position of, of what I know from lived experience. That's what I really know, right? Is the lived experiences that I've had. And so um, I think even of Kathy, when I first started working, getting to know her and then actually sitting with her at one point um, on my, on my journey and, and sitting with her and, and the way in which she accompanied me she sat with me listening to the pain that I that I carry all of that body memory um but just how she too it, that was really that that accompaniment that happened was how she um made that that safe space and um really turned things for me to, you know, she spoke earlier about those responses and made me, started making me aware of all the things that I had done right and responding to things throughout my life. And so even in these, in these um, often as, as those who non-Indigenous, you know, the allies, the co-resistors, those that want to be assisting in some way, making a difference, doing something differently. Um, I think that's, that's key to that process happening. That's that collectivity is in acknowledging to how, what, what are, what are your parts within those stories and getting to know what the real histories are of that whole process of, of colonization throughout throughout history since people um, started becoming, started coming to these lands. Um, I guess mm. I'll, I'll just go on to the next slide there, Kathy, when I think yeah. of like the, the public grieving, like what, because all of us, you know, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, like all of us suffer it, it we hurt you know as a as an energy medicine practitioner like oh, even in these times now with covid all of us are going through these up, ups and downs all the time and and i think of it like globally we're all in this pandemic and so energetically how does that affect the the, the energy the global energy right and and how we need to be supporting each other um, and in, in these, these vigils and the marches and the gatherings, um, it's a way for all of us to be coming together. And, and there's a lot of love and compassion and empathy in that. And so sometimes the way I look at the way the world works as well is because that is on the rise, that's when I often find that the opposite, the, the oppressive opposing energy or force, you know, when we, we see things like what, what happened throughout this past summer and just these past few weeks in, in, with our cousins and neighbors in the South, um, how those forces, you know, they're, they're pushing down, but there's also this rising, this uprising of, of people who, you know, our, our awareness and um, looking for that healing. Yeah. Vicki, can you go ahead seven slides, please? Yeah. So uh, my um, mom and her parents and my mom's sisters, they um, lived in Uranium City, Saskatchewan, during the Cold War. And you already know that one third of the world's uranium for the atomic race, the atomic bombs and the cold war came from Saskatchewan and the particular ore that came, that was used for the two bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki came from Delany in the Northwest territories where some of my relatives lived. So after I had cancer the second time about two years ago, um, I decided I really needed to do something about 
so I ran for the Green Party in Quebec. Can you go to the next one, please, the picture? Yeah. And when I was going out to get signatures, like there's something really awful about doing that process because we don't, you know, we don't believe in everything about it. And I had to go out and get people to sign their name on a form saying they would support me to run. And I could tell you, I met a handful of men who refused to sign it because so I couldn't participate. They didn't want a woman to run um, in the Quebec election. So it's not easy. Um, but I think it's important that we identify the leaders and particularly women leaders who are, are trying to stop violence against women and support them. And I just wanted to point out that um, Justin Trudeau's environmental minister, um, Catherine McKenna, she had to go out to the public and say, yeah, we're gonna put in a carbon tax. This is the policy of our government. She got so much attack. You can see they wrote a, a you know, very nasty word on her constituency office, like taking women's anatomy and making that so derogatory that when you write it on the wall somewhere, it's like one of the worst words you could use. And next slide, please. She said that even when she went to the movie theater with her children for a birthday party, like people would throw things at her and they would insult her. And she just had to face so much rage. Next slide, please. So this is happening everywhere. Um, women like Sheila Copps, who was in the Liberal Party, who is in the Liberal Party, was in the Parliament for many years, came out a few years ago and said that she'd been sexually assaulted when she was working in the Houses of Parliament, and that many women who work there are sexually harassed. Next slide, please. <laughs> and it's happening all through Europe women who are politicians in the European community and in European countries. So this is what happens when women get too powerful and they try to stop this or point it out that this is an issue. There's this multi-front attack on them. So we really have to, you know, um, deal with this issue and try to create enough safety around women in leadership, regardless of where, where they're going. So can you go to the uh, video now, please? So I guess the message that we want to leave you is that as social responders, we can do so much to make a person, a woman's experience dignified and respectful and calming and healing when we sit with them during and after disclosure and that the positive social response is so powerful. It can really change a person. It can restore their faith in humanity, in kindness, uh, they can transmit to the, that to their children. Yes, this is a good world. Some bad things happen, but most people are good. And that's what we need to pass down through the generations. So we're just gonna show you the power of that in a little vi video clip here. It's called People React to Being Told That They're Beautiful. It goes along with what Catherine just said. And then if, if anyone, for those of you that have time to, to stay on, uh, we'll, close, we'll close the circle with the song. Perfect. Basically, I'm making an integrated arts video and I'm just taking pictures of things I find beautiful. Things uh, that I find beautiful. Of course. <laughs> so I just need you to stand there and exist. You know, things I find beautiful. And I think you're a beautiful person. <laughs> of course. It's so awkward. It's not. Okay. 
<laughs> Things I find beautiful. And you got a great look. You're beautiful. Taking pictures of things I find beautiful. No problem, what's your name? Awesome. I find beautiful. What? Things I find beautiful. I'll catch you in the face. Oh. What? You're saying you find me beautiful? Yes, of course. You better wash your ass. You're a beautiful being and you know it. Shut up! You're a beautiful being and you know it, Zoe. Alright, are you done then? Do you have what you need? Why are you being like this? Really you're being goofy. Things I find beautiful. I'm taking pictures of things I find beautiful. Things I find beautiful. Things I find beautiful. Of course. Things I find beautiful, so. Things I find beautiful. I'm just taking pictures of things I find beautiful. That is so nice. <laughs> well, it's the truth. This has been such a great day. So I guess we'll do the strong woman song today because that seems real appropriate for this uh for this particular event, um, I'll need to, Kathy, you're going to, do you want to mute and unmute? I'll do a round and then you do a round. Okay. <clears throat> do you remember the full story on this song? It came out of the, the women's pen, right, in Kingston? Yeah. And they, because they brought the big, the big drum into the penitentiary and, uh, and this song came out of there, but it's now, it gets sung at uh, almost every, every rally, anything I've been at, there's the, the strong woman song.
Just wanted to share my drum that says no more stolen sisters. <laughs> nice drum. <laughs> Juliet Mackey. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vicky and Catherine. It was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. I have a lot of gratitude. I feel a lot of, of abundance right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who were there today, who attended this webinar. Um, hopefully we'll see you on the next ones.